Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about a forum held this week to look at child abuse in Arizona. This is the state's Child Protective Services is investigated for ignoring reports of abuse. Also tonight, we'll meet the new general director of the Arizona Opera. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. South African leader Nelson Mandela died today at the age of 95. Mandela was an iconic civil rights leader who spent nearly three decades in jail and later was elected South Africa's first black president. Reverend Oscar Tillman of the Maricopa County NAACP says he met with and talked to Mandela at a national civil rights event in Indiana in 1993. Tillman says he found Mandela to be very down to earth. Tillman also notes that there were parallels to Mandela's fight against apartheid in South Africa and the fight for a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday here in Arizona in the late 80s and early 90s. Tillman noted that Mandela provided a living, breathing example of a suffering civil rights leader to those who were too young to have personally experienced King's presence. Local civil rights leader, the Reverend Warren Stewart, says he met Mandela in New York on Mandela's first trip to the U.S. after being released from prison. Stewart says that Mandela met with U.S. church leaders to thank them for their fight against apartheid. Stewart, who was instrumental in getting a King holiday in Arizona, says Mandela's struggles provided inspiration to those fighting to honor Dr. King in the state. Again, Nelson Mandela dead at the age of 95. Hundreds of people showed up at a forum in Phoenix this week to address the latest problems with Child Protective Services. The forum was led by the Children's Action Alliance and follows the discovery that CPS failed to investigate 6,500 reported cases of child abuse and neglect. Beth Rosenberg is the Director of Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice Policy for the Alliance. She joins us now. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having um, us. This happened on Tuesday. What was yes. the goal of the forum? Well, the goal of the forum was to bring concerned citizens to come to the forum and um, to present constructive ideas in terms of how we can move forward from this. Not to look at the past, not to look at the problems that we um, have recently discovered, but see what solutions we might have for the future. Did it wind up rehashing a bit of the past, though? Um, just a little bit. I think you certainly need to start for where we are today. Um, but really, the the um, ideas and solutions that people had and, and the issues they say um, caused some of the difficulties we're having today really came forward, and we had some good ideas and good Who was thoughts. involved? Who was involved? Who was at well, the forum? Well, we had about... Um, we had 10 partner agencies that helped us um, coordinate the forum, and it was done in very short notice. And um, at the forum, we're concerned citizens, court personnel, um, um, foster care review board, foster parents, um, CASAs, which are court-appointed special advocates, and a lot of provider agencies that have worked with these children and families through the years. It sounds like a theme at the forum was do something to increase social services family services, the kinds of things that, that get to these kids and families before they wind up in absolutely, CPS. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we know one of the root causes of some of the problems now are just um, the workload for workers is much too high. They can't do everything um, that they're mandated to do with all the cases that they have. And the other thing is the fact that we have gotten rid of a lot of um, prevention and basic needs kinds of services that we've had in the past that have really helped struggling families. And, and we've heard that, that we need to re restore some of those services. And I heard it again, I guess, at the forum, social services, again, hit by budget cuts. Exactly. The major reason these yes. things are, have faltered in the past. Yes. And the idea, what, one dollar of prevention beats ten dollars down the road. Absolutely, yes. So as far as caseworkers, 77% above standard, we, mm -hmm. we know that, we hear that. Are solutions being offered there at, at your forum? What did you hear? Well, we heard, number one, that we need to rebuild the safety net, the community services. One thing that came loud and clear is that in the budget cuts in 2009, they cut child care subsidies, so low-income working families no longer have an opportunity to get some help to put their children in safe environments during the day while they work. Um, so we need to restore some of those opportunities for parents um, to keep their kids safe. We also, we need to rethink, I think everybody was saying what CPS and Child Welfare Services is all about. It's more than just investigations. It's, it's you know, keeping kids safe in their, in their homes. And once a child comes into foster care, trying to figure out what it is that will either reunite them with their families or um, provide permanent homes for them. 
Um, we had years past, and we're looking at it again, and we need to look at it again, what's called a differential response um, system. So it's not just every report you get into the CPS hotline, um, that you would need to do a full-blown investigation, that some particularly potential abuse and neglect reports that come in or low-risk report, reports that come in, um, you get a community response. You have somebody going to that family and trying to engage that family and find out what their needs are and connecting them with services. And I think the third thing we heard is that caseworkers are doing an incredible job with the resources they have, but we definitely need to lower caseloads. There is an issue about the pay for caseloads and um, support for those for those workers. An issue with turnover regarding mm -hmm. case uh, workers as well. Right. Was that addressed? I think it was addressed a little bit saying that, you know, the caseloads are impossible. People expect them to do 100% of what they're mandated to do and they can't do it. Pay was another issue saying that, you know, you come into CPS, maybe your your salary entry salary is $35,000. You can go to a hospital and make 50,000 there and you don't have to work overtime and you're not, it's not a life and death kind of thing. You're the social worker and you're trying to provide services. So the backlog of cases, we got 10,000 cases backlog for the past 60 days, 12,000 cases haven't even been opened this year that should be open. And now you've got the 6,500 that are obviously on the fast track. Mm -hmm. um, so many cases in the pipeline waiting for some, it, was that addressed and were solutions offered? I think, um, yeah, the solutions I mentioned sure. are some of the things that are offered. I think what we all recognize is that we've been following some of these issues for a long, long time. And there have been years past and, and certain periods of time when we have not investigated 100% of the reports. But that was, the department shared that with the community, with the legislature, with the governor's office. It was very open that this they didn't have the resources to do it. Um, and we got more resources when that was needed. This time, it was not clear that these were totally not investigated reports. And that's I think that's some of the concern. But it's beyond just investigating these reports. It's what happens to those kids and families afterwards. The 10,000 inactive cases that you mentioned, those are cases that are in the system that nobody um, has dealt with for two months. And the 12,000 cases are investigations that have, in fact, opened, but nobody's closed them, way beyond the time period that they are allowed by law to close a case. Were there changes to e CPS that were emphasized? I mean, that there's a lot of talk now, get it out of DES, make mm -hmm. it a standalone agency, uh, get more of a law enforcement presence, get less of a law <laughs> enforcement presence. What did you hear? Well, I think we heard that, you know, law enforcement certainly um, is helpful in, in these kinds of situations. And certainly the Office of Child Welfare Investigations have um, instituted some protocols that are, that, are, that are helpful. But the increase in the reports and the increase of the kids that are coming into foster care are due to neglect. We, um, so it's not necessarily an increase in physical or sexual abuse, it's because these kids don't have the resources they need in the community to keep them safe. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we hear. The, we've, for years, we've talked about separating out CPS and other children's services from the Department of Economic Security, which is a huge agency. And I think we can consider that and we need to take a look at that, but it is not the panacea. I mean, just taking that, service or, you know, you can take that, behavioral health, juvenile justice, all sorts of children's services mm -hmm. and put them in a separate agency. But um, that doesn't, you might be moving the chairs on the Titanic. You don't necessarily, you know, prevent the Titanic from sinking. And yet some will say, and I know that the uh, money was addressed there, getting more resources into uh, CPS in particular, DES in general, but some would say money is not a panacea either. How do you work that dynamic? I think it's a combination of a, a number of things. Money and um, just looking at the service array, looking at the policies and practices that DES has. We, the differential response um, program that I talked about, having, using um, some resources in the community to avoid those cases being investigated. That will take some money to get that started, but, and to provide services to families. A lot of that is contracted out, community providers um, that have worked with these children and families and know how to engage them. Um, but that will take money, but in the long run, it will prevent children from coming into foster care, which is far more expensive. And we don't have enough foster homes today. We're putting these kids into congregate care you know, facilities that cost a lot of money. 
and siblings that are coming into foster care, they're not all being placed in the same foster home or even in the same group home. They're spread around the valley, which increases the work workers right, have to right. have because they, you know. Last question, do you know of certain states that are doing a great job, uh, that are known for having a child protective service mm -hmm. type organization that is really doing good work. And if we know of those states, is there any movement at all to just copy what they're doing and quit trying to reinvent the wheel in Arizona? <laughs> I think every state is so different and I don't know if there's one state that does it totally right. They might do sort of investigations right, but might, might, do, mm -hmm. might not do foster care or adoption very well. So I think there are some reforms that have happened in other states, um, and we need to take a look at that. Children's Action Alliance and others have called for bringing in some national experts um, to help advise the governor, the legislature, um, the community on what it is we can do to improve our services to children and families and keep kids safe, but preserve families as well. All right, Beth, good to have you here. Thank you so much. The Colorado River has carved over 600 miles of canyons in southern Utah and northern Arizona. As sublime as these chasms are, to travelers, they pose a seemingly insurmountable problem. Just how do you get to the other side? A highway marker on US 89A commemorates a successful effort that for nearly 60 years did just that, Lee's Ferry. Mormon pioneer John D. Lee came here in 1871. He established a ferry service across the Colorado River at the only natural point for 600 miles. Lee, seen here seated on his coffin, was executed in 1877 for his role in the Mountain Meadows Massacre when 120 emigrants heading to California were murdered in Utah. The ferry operated for 52 more years, transporting thousands of hikers, horses, wagons, and even small automobiles across the river. Only the railroad, and finally in 1929, the Navajo Bridge made Lee's Ferry obsolete. Today, the original Navajo Bridge is reserved for pedestrians, while the new Navajo Bridge, built beside it in 1995, caters to cars and trucks. While the ferry itself is long gone, the name remains. Lee's Ferry is now the terminus for thousands of awestruck sightseers rafting on the mighty Colorado River. Tonight on our continuing coverage of the arts in Arizona, we meet the new director of the Arizona Opera. Ryan Taylor took the helm in July. He's here now to talk about his vision for the organization and upcoming opera productions. Good to see you here. I appreciate your having me, Ted. You are the, it's, it's your first season as general director. How's it going? True. It's actually going quite well. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. What yeah. does the general director of an opera do? Gosh, it's... Uh, it's a complicated gig, you know. You have to uh, you have to know something about the artistic product itself and uh, something about business. You have to wear both hats at the same time and keep uh, all of the elements of the company uh, in play and moving smoothly and um, executing a really high quality artistic product. Is there drama behind the drama? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> There's always drama behind the drama. I think that's part of what makes it fun. You talk yeah. about business and art and having to co-mingle here. Did you come up on the business side or come up on the artistic side? I did a little of both, actually. I have kind of a, a really varied background. Uh, I started my career after college in real estate, both commercial and residential. Uh, fell into opera sort of as a hobby and then actually spent uh, about a about a decade performing with Columbia artists throughout the world as a, a baritone on the mm -hmm. opera stage. And so uh, in the middle of that career, uh, had always been interested sort of more in the business aspect of things and had an invitation to run a smaller company in uh, Western Massachusetts for a season and did that and enjoyed it and uh, went back through uh, two jobs prior to coming to Arizona. One is an artist manager, so I mm -hmm. represented artists throughout the world okay. and sort of sold their services to operas and symphonies and, and like organizations. And then 
Um, the other uh, job was at Wolf Trap in uh, D.C., which is in Northern Virginia, um, as their manager of community development. And I worked not only on young artist training, but also on uh, sort of the marketing and development side of an opera company. So I kind of got it from both angles yeah. and, uh, and leapt in here. The, well, let's talk about here. You've mentioned real estate. New mm -hmm. real estate there on Central Avenue as far we as do. the home for the app. Talk to us about that. It's a huge upgrade for the company. This was part of, part of the city's bond initiative in 2006. Uh, we, the company moved in this past March into our uh, offices on Central Avenue. This is right across from the Phoenix Art Museum at Central and McDowell. Sits right on the light rail. Uh, provides us with not only some pretty spectacular rehearsal space for our visiting artists who come from all over the world to perform with us, but also keeps us in, in the same building with the rest of the staff who works day in and day out to make sure that we have a company to present these fabulous artists. So it's, uh, it's real convenient for us. With that in mind, how is the opera doing financially? We're doing well. We, we have a lot of progress to, uh, to tackle, a lot, a, lot, a lot of leftover issues that we need to sort of solve and move forward. What kind of past. issues? Well, when I came to the company in uh, April of this year uh, as the interim director, I'd, I'd been running the artistic uh, department. Um, but one of the things I figured out very quickly was that we had a little over $3 million worth of debt. Our annual budget is somewhere around $5.5 million. Um, so I reduced the annual budget for this year with the help of the staff. Uh, we did an emergency fundraising campaign where we had absolutely uh, unprecedented uh, participation from our board, from the community, from the staff, 100% uh, participation across the board, raised a million dollars to pay down part of that debt. Um, and then we uh, have launched through the season and met all of our annual goals so far. So we've, we're about $65,000 ahead and we've just launched the campaign for another million to is, reduce the debt. Is that a new, now the financial model obviously had to change. Did it change temporarily? Has it changed for good? Is there a new direction? What's happening here? I think part of what's, uh, what's important for arts organizations is that you've got to get not only a financial picture that works, but an artistic picture that works. And, uh, and the blend of those with any arts organization is how you respond and interact with your community. So I think what you'll see is that the company will continue to extend itself into the community in new and different ways, especially going into the rest of this season and into next year. And you talk about extending yourself into the community. We got concerts at First Friday, or at least collaborations. Talk to us about that. Musical Instrument Museum, events there as well? We do. Well, the, the building itself has been an amazing tool for us to reach out to the community. We have other groups that come in and use the building uh, as a rehearsal space, as an event space. Um, we have a concert Sunday called Holiday Soundtrack that our studio artists will perform. These are exceptionally talented young singers. We audition uh, about 150 live every year after getting applications from over 600. It is harder to get into this program than it is to get into Harvard. And these six talented young people will sing at the MIM on Sunday, some sort of holiday classics. Uh, they also perform main stage for us. So uh, we do some work with them on First Fridays. We've also partnered with the Arizona School for the Arts, um, with the Desert Botanical Garden this year. Um, there's others that escape yes. me at the moment, but it's, it, it really is sort of part of what our, our mission is about, is just to tell all kinds of stories that are worth singing. And some of those are three hours long at Symphony Hall and in Tucson at the Music Center, but some of them are really intimate, special stories, and there's all kinds of different ways for us to tell them. Yeah. You mentioned young people auditioning and, and mm -hmm. so many folks are interested. I think that's kind of encouraging for folks who do like the finer arts, classical music, opera, these sorts of things, ballet. What are you seeing out there as far as the future? Because we keep hearing classical music's on its deathbed and <laughs> opera can't go on. And, uh, what are you seeing out there? You know, it's interesting. The, the classical music's on its deathbed uh, ha has been a, a refrain that has been rung for three or four hundred years now. If you go back and look at Mozart's publishers uh, and some of his wife's notes, their worry was that Mozart's music would never be heard in the future because the audiences were, were aging and maybe uh, new audiences weren't coming forward. And Tchaikovsky wrote the same thing just a few, you know, a few years later. So uh, really, I think it, it has to do with stage of life. Um, if you have experience and you have culture in your life from the time that a parent sings you a lullaby, then you have something that stays with you your entire life long 
and you will learn to love when people sing to you. I mean, who, who doesn't love a great tune, you know, and a great story? So I think it's, uh, it's something that I'm not worried about uh, the longevity of the art form itself. It will be with us in one form or another. I think when we go out and we look at auditioning young singers, what is becoming more and more important is not just the voice, yes. but it is something uh, that has to do with um, your presentation and your connection to your community and what sorts of stories do you as an artist want to tell uh, that will affect our community and how does that resonate throughout the state of Arizona? You know, we're one of only a handful of companies in the United States that produce as much opera as mm -hmm. we do and we're the only one that does it in two major metropolitan cities. With um, that in mind, real quickly, we have about 30 seconds yeah. left here. Talk to us about the rest of the season, what you got coming up. It's fantastic. We have La Boheme, the greatest love story ever sung. We have La Traviata, which is uh, roughly the same story as Pretty Woman, if you remember the, the uh, sure. movie with Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. And finally, we've got Don Pasquale, which is uh, an amazing Commedia dell'arte story. Same rough characters. You can almost draw a line between the characters in Don Pasquale and Frasier, the sitcom. And uh, we've updated this piece now because it is a comedy and isn't set in a specific time period. Uh, we've updated it to 1950 and uh, have taken sort of a, a bit of artistic inspiration from the Hollywood retrospective going on at the museum at the same time. Well, it sounds like good stuff and good things are happening out there. Congratulations and good luck. I appreciate it very much. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalist Roundtable. A new report finds major workplace safety violations in the fighting of the Yarnell Hill fire, and the governor formed a task force to oversee CPS. That and more Friday on the Journalist's Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.